song remind us, come now, found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. We sing now together hymn number 13, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Let's stand as we sing. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, please keep upon your minds and in your hearts a number of our members who are sick and absent from us for the time being. Uh, Glenn and Marie Martin both have COVID, so they're going through battles with Glenn being in the hospital. Also, Naomi Floyd has uh, COVID, and so she's going through some difficult times right now. So let's go to the Lord for these, but they represent so many others who are sick amongst us. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do come to you grateful, recognizing that you are completely sovereign over all things, that nothing has control but you. And so, Lord God, we lift our prayers up to you, knowing that uh, you hear and you answer our prayers. We do pray for those who are amongst us who are sick, who are injured, who are recovering. We pray for those who are in need, and we pray, Lord God, for this worship service. We pray, God, that you will allow us to worship you in truth and in spirit. We pray, Lord God, that we will uh, realize a manifestation of your uh, Holy Spirit in every element of our praise. And I pray, Lord God, that lives will be changed because you have spoken to us today. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for allowing us to worship you, our almighty God, for it's in the precious name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Uh, Please be seated at this time. I do want to welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning. I'm glad you've chosen to worship an almighty God with us. Uh, In your bulletin, you'll see a connect card. That is a a way that we can keep record of those who have come to visit us. So if you're a visitor, please take a few moments of your time and fill out the connect card. Tear it out of the bulletin and place it in the offertory plate at the end of the service. Uh, A couple things have been happening over this last week I wanted to mention because it's been tremendous. 
this Friday, we had uh, coming to visit us from the King's Academy about uh, 10 middle school students along with a, a teacher and uh, one of their parents. And uh, they came here simply to work in our community. And so they did a wonderful job. I had them out in the rain. I told them I have an indoor project, but they said, no, we want to stay out in the rain. And we are out in the rain putting up that green uh, privacy area for the backyard or for the uh, children's area. And they were such a blessing. They just worked and worked until it was time for them to go back to school. And so it was a wonderful thing just having uh, uh, youth from our area, our community coming and joining us. But then also we had some ladies who were here while we were working. They were working. They were taking care of flower arrangements. They were taking care of all the uh, clothing downstairs that we're stocking up and, and getting ready to give out to homeless from the Homeless Connect. And so they're uh, at work. And then on Saturday we had the men's ministry. And if you have not seen some of the outside cuttings and how uh, pretty it looks, especially on uh, this side of the church as you're going towards Palmetto, uh, street, you'll see uh, a lot of the trees have been either removed or cut down low. You can see parts of the building you haven't seen in probably 40 years. And they did a wonderful job, hard work uh, from uh, about a dozen men or so yesterday uh, morning. And so it was a wonderful uh, work of, uh, week of work, if you can put it that way. And so uh, that's one of the ministries that we have going on here with our men's ministry, with our ladies' ministry. And right now, uh, Brother Harry is going to share with us a little bit about our senior adult ministry. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Have you ever realized that God was preparing you for something, but you didn't know what it was? Well, I grew up as the youngest in my extended family, and so did Rita. And so early on, we realized that we had a special bond with senior adults. And long before I was asked to lead a senior adult ministry, we started working with senior adults in our very first church. And so we have kind of grown up with senior adults, and we love that. But here, I want to talk to you a little bit about the ministries of First Baptist. And if I were to, to go into detail about everything that we do as far as senior adult ministry, I'd take up way too much time. So I just want to highlight a few of the things that are, that are really significant that I think that uh, we're able to do. The first is our bereavement ministry. Everyone in our church practically is on the bereavement team. And it, when, we, when a person loses a loved one, we're able to minister to them, whether it be a senior adult or a younger adult or whatever. And uh, that gives us a chance to, to just reach out in a time of crisis and say, we love you. We've not forgotten you. We want you to know that you're special. We also have a, a ministry that's directed uh, especially toward our homebound ministry, and those are the caregivers. Now, a caregiver uh, does the role of a minister in that they make phone calls, they visit when it's appropriate, uh, they send birthday cards, uh, they send holiday cards, they send all sorts of things. And the other thing is that when they do find out that a senior adult, especially a homebound member, is in need or has changes, they communicate with our office so that we can communicate with the, the Sunday school class and with the deacon. We also have some things that we would call in-reach. We have regular monthly luncheons that have great meals, fellowship, and, and uh, programs that we can enjoy. And you know, it's just good to come together with a group of people that's like you and sit down and laugh and talk and visit. We also have had trips up until COVID. We had some really good trips that, uh, that we participated in. My favorite trip, and I think most of the senior adults would say their favorite trip, was to go to Myrtle Beach and see the Christmas show, and that's always a highlight. But we've had other trips that have gone along well. One of the ministries that you might not be aware of is our ministry to area nursing homes. We have two Sunday school groups that go to the nursing home and lead them in Sunday school each week. And we actually count them in our attendance because they are a part of us. And, and that's a wonderful ministry that we can do. In, a, in addition to that, we have had groups from our choir and handbells and other groups that have gone to the uh, nursing homes at, at uh, special times. We went uh, last year and, and did a Christmas program for two different nursing homes, went in and ran 
sang and sang and, and carols, and that was always a joy. But we are helping in any way that we can with these nursing homes, and many times we even get called out to, to go and to pray for someone that perhaps doesn't have a, a church affiliation. We're so glad that we also have Facebook Live that we can minister to folks in their own homes. And a lot of our senior adults uh, plug us in every week and watch us. Uh, they see Brother Tom Grant leading a Sunday school class every week. And it's so awesome that we have what we call high tech that we can use to minister to folks when we can't be there personally. And so those are a few things, but there's one last thing that I wanna to mention to you, and that is Senior Adult Vacation Bible School. We always look forward to that. It's always a fun time doing a lot of different things, and we're just praying that, that COVID's gonna be away far enough this year that we can do that again. We missed it last year, but we're looking forward to it. So those are just a few of the ways that we minister, and, and many of you could stand and tell of other ministries that your Sunday school class is doing or your different group or you as a deacon or whatever. So as we reach out to senior adults, we are so honored that God has let us minister to this very special age group. I do want to spend some time in prayer for the senior adult ministry at this church. Uh, but you know, when I think about Senior Adult Vacation Bible School, I just imagine them folks running up and down the halls and bouncing on balls and doing relays. You know, that's what those senior adults do, right? right. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord and let's uh, thank Him. We do have a large senior adult uh, population in our church, and we're so glad that we can minister to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We're thankful, Lord God, for... Uh, those we have who are members of our church who are deeply involved in serving in our church and serving in this community. And Lord, we recognize that uh, there is so much that is accomplished because of our senior adult population here at First Baptist Church. And we thank you, Lord, for them. We're thankful for their wisdom. We're thankful, Lord God, for their, uh, their experience. And we're thankful, Lord God, for their dedication to continue to serve you. Uh, no matter with, with age not being a barrier. And so, Lord God, I pray for blessings upon this group as we begin to uh, regather, uh, as we surface out of this uh, COVID-19 era. I pray, Lord God, that there will be a regathering of these various senior adult ministries. I pray that it will flourish. And I pray, Lord God, specifically for Reverend uh, Harry as he continues to minister to the needs of this church, not just in the area of music, but Lord God, as he is a blessing to so many senior adults. I pray, Lord God, that he'll be able to gather people around him that will help him to serve and to help him to reach out to others who are in need. Thank you for the vi uh, this vital ministry to our senior adults. We love you, we praise you, and it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we do pray, amen. We're now going to be blessed as Brother Harry shares with us a message and song. From God's heaven to a manger, from great riches to the poor, came the Son of God to seek and save. From the azure halls of heaven to a rough and rugged cross, Jesus came to his life for all he gave. Redeeming love, a love that knows no limit. Redeeming love, a love that shall not die. My soul shall sing throughout the endless ages with choirs extolling His great love on high. From a loving Heavenly Father to a world that knew Him not came the man of sorrows, Christ the Lord. In my wandering 
bought my soul with his own blood, gave to me a peace this world could not afford. Redeeming love, a love that knows no limit. Redeeming love, a love that shall not die. My soul shall sing throughout the endless ages with choirs extolling His great love on high. God's love does extend. Thank you, thank you. God's love extends, and I tell you what, at times when we, we feel like the world is coming apart, God's love reaches out and touches us. One of the things that God loves also does is to guide us, and sometimes we're making journey uh, decisions through our journey, and God gives us leadership, guidance that we need so much at that time. So I want to ask you to join with me as we sing hymn number 83. Hymn number 83, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you and be seated. There are some songs that come out that just grab you. And I don't mean that in a, a nonsensical way. There are some songs that come out for Christians that touch your heart the first time you hear them. This is one that touched my heart the very first time that I heard it. And I believe that God will use it this morning to touch all of our hearts as we're reminded of the scripture Lord, I will lift my heart to Thee. Thank you. 
I am so happy that the choir is back, even if it's not the full choir. I just love having you here and leading us in worship, so thank you for blessing our souls. One of the reasons why I really enjoy having a choir is when they're not here, I hear a lot of myself singing, and let me tell you, it's not very good, so I am so glad you're back because you cover me well. I'm glad that you're here worshiping God with us. I really am. What a pleasure it has been. Last Sunday was such a blessing as we looked at the power of prayer. Uh, my wife and I, we like to go on cruises. I just, if, in case you want to buy me a gift, I'm just putting it out there. We, we do. We do like to go on cruises. That's one of the vacation things we like to do. So far, since COVID-19 has taken place, we have had three cruises canceled. Can you believe that? That's just the way it goes. But cruises aren't the only thing we need to like to do. Deborah and I have an alternative vacation plan, and that is we like to go to this very small town. It's just south of Cincinnati, Ohio. It's St. Petersburg in Kentucky. But really, we don't get to see the town. We go there because there's a, a museum called the Creation Museum. And uh, Deborah and I are lifetime members of the Creation Museum and of the Ark Encounter. They are both ran by the same organization called Answers in Genesis, whose president is Ken Ham. Now, we go to this location and we enjoy visiting this wonderful museum. And if you ever want a recommendation, I'm giving it to you right here, right now. Go there. You will be blessed. But one of the things I like about the Creation Museum is its organization. It's organized in what they call the seven C's of history, movements throughout history. The seven C's go like this. It begins with part of the, the museum being about creation and then corruption as sin enters the, uh, the human history. And from uh, corruption, it goes to cat, uh, catastrophe as we recognize the global flood of Noah. From uh, catastrophe, it goes to confusion as you look at the Tower of Babel and the separation of the languages and the different people groups. And then we come to the parts of history, that, that long place of history from what we read in Genesis chapter 10 through 12 where we talk about the confusion that takes place all the way up to the coming of Christ. That's the fifth C. And then uh, the, sixth, or the sixth C of history is the cross. And then we come to the seventh C, which really isn't history. It's more of our future, and that is the consummation. And so as you go through this, the seven C's of history, what you have is the precious word of God. Now I bring that up just to come back to it in just a moment. As we've been looking at our theme for 2021, we're talking about moving forward. And the first sermon series was moving forward in power. 
And so over the last three Sundays, and this being now the fourth, here's what we've looked at. We've looked at the power of God's Word. God's Word, which is literal, it is living, and it is loving. We looked at the power of God's Word. We then examined the power, not only of, of God's Word, but the power of, well, the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit that indwells us. The same Holy Spirit that has the power of an almighty God lives inside each and every one who places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We looked at the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, last week, we looked at the power of prayer. We have those three wonderful powers that you and I can rely upon. God's Word, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. And this morning, we want to look at the fourth and final area of power, although... Please don't get me wrong, I'm sure there was more. But for this sermon series, we're going to look at the power of the gospel. Now to take us back to the Creation Museum, when you look at the first seas of history, the first four seas, we see the power of God throughout history, but all of it points to the, sec or to the fifth and the sixth sea. It all points to Jesus Christ. It all points to the power of the gospel. So with that in mind, please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Romans chapter 1, I'll be reading verse 16 and 17. These are the words of the Apostle Paul as encouraged and as moved by the Holy Spirit of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your almighty power. Thank you for your omnipotence. Thank you for revealing your omnipotence within your word, within uh, uh, your spirit, within the power of prayer that you've placed within us. But Lord God, thank you for the power of the gospel message. Thank you, Lord God, for the saving grace that you have given to us. Thank you for this precious word. And I pray as we continue to look closer, as we examine this passage, and as we look to the gospel message that you'll speak to our hearts, transform our lives, empower us to live for you daily. For it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. A couple weeks ago, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, uh, in the evening service, I told a story about my daughter that just seemed appropriate to tell it again this morning. So if you've heard it, please bear with me. And that is simply uh, years ago while she was still in college living with Deborah and I. I went shopping with her, and I won't tell you what store it's in. You might boo me. Just kidding. But we went shopping, and as we are looking, my daughter Kate started singing out loud. She was singing out loud. I wasn't talking. She was just whispering to yourself. Sometimes you hear people coming by. She was singing, and of course, she was singing hymns, gospel hymns. And I started to look around because she was singing out loud. You know what I mean? And, I, and finally, I was seeing who was close to hear it, and I, I looked at Kate. I said, Kate, you're singing out loud. And then she abruptly reminded me, well, maybe they need to hear. Amen. You and I, we need to be cognizant of those who are around us are lost and dying without Jesus. And whether we sing them the gospel message, preach them the gospel message, or share the truth by our witness of the gospel in our lives, we need to recognize the power of the gospel message. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul wrote about his imprisonment. He says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering of the gospel according to the power. Whether we're in prison, it doesn't matter. Share the gospel message. 
as you and I look at this wonderful passage in Romans chapter 1, and we see about the power of the gospel unto salvation, does that just strike a chord within your heart and a need for your lips to open and share the gospel message? There's a question that no doubt all of us probably already know the answer to. But I want to ask the question and spend some time answering the question. The question is, have you ever wondered why there is such power in the gospel? In this passage, this is explained to us in three different ways. Well, how, how this, there's such power in the gospel? So here's the first thing I want us to take note of. We find here that it, that being the gospel message, it is powerful because of its message. Indeed, when we look at the Greek term used here that's, that's translated gospel, it's that Greek word evangelium. It's made up of two uh, words. That second part, is, we also get the root word for angel or messenger. But it's that first part, that uh, transliteration, E-U-U, -U, that we get that word good from. A eulogy is a good word. A evangelism is the good message, the gospel message. It is powerful because of the message itself. The good news, this powerful message exists for a number of reasons. It exists first because of the source of the gospel. Paul boisterously announces, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The very source of the gospel is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The power of the gospel, the source of the gospel is God Himself. That makes this a powerful message. It's powerful, it's God's for a couple reasons. Number one, the gospel transcends all, for it comes from the one who is transcendent. Let me say that again. The gospel transcends all, because it comes from the one who is transcendent. That word transcendent just simply means above all. Because God is above all. Because God is above creation. Because God reached down and created us. He is above us. Because of that, His very message transcends all things. You understand what that means? It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what color your skin is, how economically rich or poor you are, the gospel is for you because it transcends all of your problems. That's the source of the gospel. The gospel transcends for it comes from the one who is transcendent. The gospel, when you think about the source, the gospel also transforms for it comes from the one who is eminent. The gospel transforms because it comes from the one who is eminent. To transcend means to be above all. To be eminent is to be amongst us, to be intimate with us. God came down. God came down to you and me and walked amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ. He sh Jesus showed us who God is. He is eminent. And because of that, He can transform our hearts. The source of the gospel is the divine Godhead of God the Father, God the Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the source of the gospel. And that makes it powerful. But not only do we look to the source of the gospel, what, what about the substance of the gospel? When you think about a message, what puts that message together? What is the substance of the gospel message? Well, simply put, it's the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. This means that God became man. That's the incarnation, the gospel of Christ, our text calls it. We understand who Christ is. It is Jesus, the Son of God. 
If you and I were to turn to John chapter 1 and look at first one when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, we understand that Jesus is the Word. Because in John chapter 1, down in verse 14, it also says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. And when you think about the gospel message, the very substance begins with the incarnation of God. God became like man in the person of Jesus Christ. When you think about the substance of the gospel, we can't help but turn to the crucifixion. God, Jesus, became man so that He can die a substitutionary death, a death of atonement for my sins and for your sins. See, that's the substance of the gospel. Jesus died for you and for me. The substance of the gospel not only includes the incarnation and the crucifixion, but it, it also includes the blessed resurrection. You see, death could not hold Jesus, could not keep Him down. But after three days of death, He rose again. In other words, He was resurrected. And because of His resurrection, we too have the promise that we will be resurrected again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, in that wonderful dissertation on the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, the Apostle Paul begins that chapter with the gospel. Let me read the beginning verses, verse 1 and following. Paul wrote, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, uh, to, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That's the incarnation and the crucifixion. For Christ to exist, the incarnation had to occur, and for Christ to die for our sins, the crucifixion had to take place. He continues with the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to scriptures. The resurrection of Jesus is essential for our faith because we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Lord. That's the substance of the gospel and it's powerful because of the source, the Godhead, and because of the substance, uh, substance, the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus says of, him, of himself, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. It is powerful because of its message, because of the source, and because of the substance of the message. But that's not the only reason why it's powerful. It is powerful because of the message, but it is also powerful because of the magnitude. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. Listen, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, but also for the Greek, the magnitude of the gospel can be understood here in two different ways. First of all, it can be understood in the deliverance of those who believe. If we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the, gospels, the gospel power saves us. That's the promise given by Romans, given in Scripture. The deliverance of those who believe. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty definitive. Paul would later also write three verses, four verses later, verse 13, Romans chapter 10. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The magnitude of the gospel is the deliverance to those who believe. The question that we must ask ourselves is, what do we believe? Well, I've already talked about the gospel itself, the substance, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Do you believe? There's a contemporary Christian group known as the Newsboys who wrote a wonderful song about what it is we believe. In fact, the title of the song is We Believe. 
And if you looked at the chorus of the song, it really is what we believe. The chorus goes like this. We believe in God the Father. Can you say amen to that? We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit and He's given us new life. Has the Holy Spirit of God given you new lease in this life you live? That song goes, uh, continues. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and He's coming back again. We believe. We believe it's more than just words that we say. In fact, we believe is our statement of faith. We believe is our call to action. We believe is our witness in this world today. We believe the magnitude of the gospel. We find here that its magnitude is the deliverance to those who believe. Have you been delivered? Here's another way to look at the magnitude of the gospel. We also see here the dimension of who it can reach. The dimension of who it can reach. Paul also wrote, for everyone who believes. Then he says, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. There's but one gospel. One gospel. And that one gospel is for all of us. And it's for everyone who believes, Paul wrote. I don't know about you, but I'm a firm believer in the whosoever gospel. I'm a firm believer in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The dimensions of who it can reach is that it can reach everyone. That's the declaration of Paul. That's the declaration of Scripture. And that's the declaration of our lives, isn't it? Each and every one of us come from a slightly different walk of life. Yet God reached down to us, pulled us out of the, the miry clay, set us on the rock of Jesus Christ, delivered us as we believed in Him. The dimension of who it can reach. This declaration, I am not ashamed. This declaration of the whosoever gospel, I can boldly proclaim and I can say I don't understand every element of the sovereignty of God, how he can work it out throughout human history and still I have a choice that has to be made. I have to have faith in him. I understand that I'm saved by the grace of God through faith. And even that little faith that God has given to me is a gift from Him, that faith to believe. But eventually I have to make the decision to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The dimension of who it can reach, all who believe, to the Jews but also to the Greek, to the original Na nation that God blessed to all nations of the world. That's the power of the gospel. It's powerful because of its message. It's powerful because of its magnitude. But thirdly, it's also powerful because of its manifestation. Listen again as I read verse 17. For in it, listen, for in it, it being the gospel. For in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You understand that to manifest is to reveal, to make known, to make clear to the eye and to the mind. And that's what the gospel does. It makes clear to us. And in the passage I just read, it makes clear to us a couple things. First of all, when you think about the gospel, we see God's righteousness is revealed. In the gospel message, the righteousness of an almighty God can be clearly seen. That's what verse 17 is teaching us. That's what it's telling us. If you think about it, we see the message of the gospel reveals God's righteousness in those three areas I talked about. The incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. His righteousness by the incarnation. God revealed His righteousness by providing a means by which we can be reconciled. God is a righteous God. By the uh, crucifixion, God revealed His righteousness by punishing sin that forgiveness can be for, uh, given to us. 
By the resurrection, God revealed his righteousness by making salvation available to the believer. That's the righteousness of God revealed through the incarnation, crucifixion, the resurrection. We also see the manifestation of the gospel revealed God's righteousness in the believer. Think about that. Not only does the gospel message reveal the righteousness of God through the uh, wonderful and powerful acts of Jesus Christ, but God's righteousness is filled, manifested, revealed through you and through me. That's amazing. That last part of the passage uh, that I read a moment ago it says that, uh, that God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith alone. I just find it amazing that God would choose me to reveal his righteousness, and yet his righteousness is still revealed through me. Me, Michael, you as well. I find that amazing. I read a passage of scripture a moment ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Let me read it again. Paul wrote, for he made him, he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we, that me, that you, that the human race who places their faith and trust in Jesus, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, in the here and now, people could see the righteousness of God. And without a doubt, in the here and then, we will have be clothed in the per perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. The manifestation of the gospel reveals the very righteousness in the believer. God's righteousness revealed in the gospel message. You know what else is revealed in the gospel message? And that's God's faithfulness. In fact, God's faithfulness is finalized in the gospel message. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now at first glance of that concluding verse, one would look at it and say, well, isn't that talking about my faithfulness? No, it's talking about God's faithfulness. But it just sounds as if it's referring to Man's faith, the just shall live by faith alone. However, when we look at the history of where that came from, we know it's completely different. In fact, Paul is quoting Habakkuk 2, verse 4, where it says, but the just shall live by faith. He parallels that passage because he's drawing a parallel uh, conclusion with the prophet. The prophet was uh, at wit's end during that time. Habakkuk was about ready to lose it in his book. The Jewish people were wicked. They were evil. And yet God had told him that they were gonna, he was going to send a nation that's even more wicked than the Jewish people. The Babylonians, he said, the wicked Babylonians are going to come down and they're going to destroy you. But then he gave to Habakkuk a wonderful promise he said don't worry because the just shall live by faith alone in the midst of this terrorizing premonition in the in the midst of this horrible sounding prophecy God says it's okay those wicked Babylonians are going to come down they're going to destroy but it's okay I always have a remnant God always has a remnant. And he says, the faith shall live. The just shall live by faith alone. God is faithful. Now the Apostle Paul uses that same phrase. And if you think about what's going on in, the, the, in Rome during that time. In fact, when Paul wrote this letter about three years earlier under the, uh, uh, the leadership of Claudius, if you can call it leadership, there is a lot of bickering going on in the Jewish faith. They're trying to ask the question who, and answer, who is this Jesus? They were arguing, debating about this new sect, this new portion of what they called the Jewish faith, called the way. And there was such a disturbance that three years prior to writing this letter, all the Jews were banished from Rome. They were sent packing under Claudius. 
But now as Paul wrote this letter, the Jews were being let back into Rome. But things had sli uh, changed slightly. It might have been better if they were banished. Now as they turned to Rome, persecution was beginning. Persecution not only from the, their own Jewish people, but persecution from the Roman government as well. And Paul tells them the power of the gospel message. And oh, by the way, the just shall live by faith alone. He was giving them that reassurance that in the midst of the power of the gospel ma uh, message, God is faithful. And God will see you through. We are going through a little bit of a hard time, a little rough patch. Nothing compared to other points in history. And listen, God will see us through. In other words, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. That doesn't mean we don't use common sense in this day and age. But we do not allow fear to override our faith. We do not stop the command of the Great Commission because there's a disease out there. The question I would ask each of us is what have we stopped doing for God because we have allowed fear to take our place? Have we stopped worshiping God? Have we stopped ministering to a community that is in need of the gospel message? Because that goes back to the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel, it is powerful. It is powerful because it manifests God. His righteousness and His faithfulness no matter what our circumstance is. The power of of the gospel you know the gospel is more than just news it's the good news of Jesus Christ the gospel is more than just directions for us to, to diminish sin in our lives oh no uh, the gospel is the destruction of sin in our lives it's more than just a temporary solution for our lives and what's going on today it is eternal solution for all the days that's the power of of the gospel and it's powerful because of its message its magnitude and because of its manifestation it reveals to us the righteousness and the faithfulness of God what we have in our Christian faith is power we operate in this world today as if we don't have power we're the minority. Christianity has always been the minority. There is not one time that it has really, truly been the majority. It is the minority. But there is power in the gospel. There is power in prayer. There is power in the Holy Spirit. And there is power in the precious Word of God. And if we cannot rely on that power, then guess what? We have no power at all. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I serve the one who has all power. As we saw last week and we talked about the power of prayer... God can take our prayers, not because we had one worship service where uh, most of us came down on bended knee. Prayer doesn't really work that way. Prayer works when we're always on bended knee. Prayer works when our soul is always crying out to the Lord. The Holy Spirit works as we move uh, in accordance to God's will. The Holy Spirit works with us as we read the power of God's Word, not just because we showed up on Sunday, but we lived Monday through Saturday in accordance to it. And the power of the gospel will not show itself if you remain silent. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you this morning. Thank you for your message. You are powerful God. And if I serve a powerful Lord, if, if we serve a powerful Lord, then who, who, what can be against us? Nothing at all. Lord, I pray that 
as we've spoken about the power that comes strictly from you. That each and every one of us here today, those who are perhaps watching on uh, live right now or who will view this later, I pray, Lord God, that we would meditate closely upon these things that give us power, your power, and that we will allow them to be lived out in our lives. Lord, I pray for everyone who is present right now. I pray that they've experienced the power of the gospel message. And I pray, Lord God, that you're working in the heart of those who perhaps haven't taken that step, step of faith towards you, haven't received your son as, as prompted by the Holy Spirit and in accordance to your word. I pray that today they will receive Jesus, that they'll come down front, take my hand and simply say, I want to know Jesus. I pray, Lord God, for each member here, each follower of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord God, that there will be a stirring within their hearts, a stirring that will cause them to have a deep desire to spend more time with you, to draw closer to you, and then to share with others that closeness. I pray, Lord God, that you will work in our hearts and in our minds as by the preaching of your word and the prompting of your spirit, you move us to make decisions. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation, our hymn of decision. It is hymn number 419. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. And let me tell you, we have been in the midst of some tumultuous times. And the same Lord who called us years ago to salvation is, that, is the same one who calls us into the harvest field. Let's stand and let's sing together and then you move as God calls upon you to move, brother. Amen. I hope you've been blessed by being in the house of the Lord today. 
I do hope you'll take time to come join us this evening as we continue to worship God in song and in the preaching of the Word. Now, I know some of you might say, but isn't tonight the Super Bowl? We're going to have a Super Bowl right here. We're going to worship the Lord God Almighty. Plus, we're done by seven. You can get home, skip the halftime because you know that ain't going, that's not good for you. And you can watch the most important part of the game, and that's the last half. Come and join us this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and be on our way. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for the blessing of gathering in your name. We're thankful, Lord God, for our Sunday school teachers who taught uh, your word today, empowered by your spirit. We're thankful, Lord God, for our choir being back with us. And uh, we pray, Lord God, that their numbers will increase and be strengthened. And we pray that you will continue to keep them safe. Uh, And Lord, we pray for each person who is here. We pray, Lord God, that our hearts are different because we've been in your presence this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Here at FBC Florence, we're a family, and we'd like to thank you for joining our family for worship this morning. We'd love to have you join us again at our service tonight at 6 and at the gathering at 6 on Wednesday night. This broadcast is made possible by the generous and loving contributions of the members and friends of First Baptist Church of Florida.